Okay. I'm going to get into these other videos. Um, I'm probably going to skip past the parts where they answer the questions and just go through my notes to see where I had it marked for particular spots in the video that I want to discuss. But, um, I think it started at 8.50 something after you asked the question. I think that what, what happened in, in the wake of Black Power, right, uh, was in retrospect, at least, a predictable phenomenon, right? Um, that um, as, and, and and frankly, I mean, both Cedric Johnson and Preston Smith have, have helped me um, see and articulate this, uh, um, this dynamic in a more textured way. Because um, Black Power was always two things, right? It was, um, a, an expressive or a performative um, radical politics, right? Um, and it was um, a de facto ideology for um, consolidation of a new black political class. You know, professional and managerial uh, um, types who were able to respond to the expanded opportunity structures that opened after the landmark legislation of the mid '60s, which, by the way, included people like like me, and what happened was, since so much of Black Power radicalism was performative, didn't have an institutional agenda, uh, you know, didn't really have a practical program that it was possible to organize around. Uh, it just kind of fell fell by the way. But right. the real story was was a natural transition, um, you know, into uh, and a class-based based ethnic politics on the model that that was dominant in uh, post-war American uh, political life in in uh, most parts of the country and especially like um, and, okay. in the realm of urban politics. So let's go and review just a little bit of the ideas where what he's talking about when he said uh, Cedric Johnson and Preston Smith, because I have the videos where they're interviewed and they, they kind of summarize some of their views on this. Your book explains how the focus on class-based policy of the black leftists in the depression era sometimes clashed with the race first inclinations of black civic elites. The main way you draw the distinction between the two distinguishing social, the two distinguishing factors is by social, by using the term social democracy, which is the preferred, was the preferred vehicle, vehicle of the black leftists and racial democracy, which was the preferred vehicle of black elites. Can you explain the difference in these two outlooks? Uh, certainly. Um, I mean, first of all, I wanted to uh, think about uh, a framework uh, that got us outside of the usual binaries of integration versus separatism or protest versus accommodation. And so that's why um, thinking through, you know, I wanted to see, uh, was there an orientation um, around racial inequality and class inequality that inform the, both the thinking and the, uh, the planning and the politics of you know, the professional managerial class. Um, racial democracy is simply uh, this idea that um, you know, uh, there should be a, a racial group access to all social goods. And that's measured proportionally, right? So basically the idea that if there are 10% of white folks who uh, have access to a, uh, a neighborhood or a job or uh, some, you know, healthcare, uh, quality healthcare, then there ought to be 10% black folks. Um, and so that's how it's measured. But the whole idea mainly is a non-discriminatory and equal access to social goods and largely uh, for qualified individuals. The idea of social democracy um, really in contradistinction from, from racial democracy is this idea that basically you need uh, uh, a sort of broad access. You need uh, 
universal programs to um, deal with particular problems uh, or particular um, yeah issues within society. So, um, so in talking about black power, here's where some of the confusion uh, begins, right? I mean, black power uh, was a term that was used by all sorts of different people um, before '66, right? Uh, it was a term that was used. Uh, as the title of a book by um, Richard Wright when he traveled to uh, newly independent Ghana. Um, it was also a term that was used by people like uh, Adam Clayton Powell in some of his speeches in the, in the early to mid 60s. Um, many authors on the pages of Liberator magazine uh, used the term black power. And of course, people within SNCC were using it um, in many ways in relationship to the campaigns they were staging in places like Lowndes County, Alabama, right, where you had, you know, black people in a numerical majority in some of these, these black belt counties, but at the same time, um, completely powerless and unrepresented in terms of formal government. And so we should start from that, right, that it's, it, it always was a phrase that had different meanings for different speakers, for different audiences. And it's when um, Stokely Carmichael popularizes a chant, which he didn't invent. Uh, it was actually uh, invented by Willie Ricks, another uh, member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And um, when he popularizes that during the uh, 1966 Meredith March, right, James Meredith was shot in ambush um, as he was taking a solitary march from uh, Memphis down to Jackson. Um, when he's shot and his protest or his march is taken over by uh, this conflict between clergy and different, uh, in particular, uh, Roy Wilkins, you know, who was no fan of black power from its very beginning, would condemn it. Um, and other people, of course, even King would try to distance himself from that concept in the immediate uh, moment. The problem, again, is that it's a slogan, right? And so what does it mean? Um, you know, it, it speaks to a certain sense of uh, disenfranchisement that many people still had at that particular moment. But it's not until, um, you know, we, when Carmichael and, and uh, Charles Hamil Hamilton begin to pin and, and give a sense of their operational definition of, right? Um, so I think, you know, there's a, there's a way in which it, it's evocative, right? And there was a particular kind of response from whites and particular, you know, people who were afraid of black power as some form of, of black domination, uh, who had a problem with it. But in its operational form, what it came to mean basically was black integration into um, the institutions of um, governance at the local, state, and national level. Okay, I think you get the point there. So, first of all, what I said I wasn't going to discuss, so I'm still not going to discuss it here, but is the series that I did on the integration. I can probably bring up the web uh, video version of this that I did, because that's the first thing he mentioned. He wanted to um, get out of the binary, but he just created a new binary between social democracy and um, racial democracy, which is still uh, like an unfitting binary, just like the rest of them. So the video that I did kind of explains, I'm hoping this doesn't pop on it might. Okay. I need to go to my videos. There we go. So the video that I did on explaining this is going to be why it's not about separation and integration, but being radical, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist. But then the series that I did was on the website was a series on integration. So the first issue that I guess I could bring up is that the, um, the social democracy basically just takes a different group and opposes it to a different group when those that's not the that's not the range of ideas that actually exist not even in a kind of a simplified fashion right 
So what I'd argue, and I did argue, is that two sides of controlled opposition minimum existed. Obviously, there's a lot more. But minimum existed, if you want to do like the binary, those were the controlled opposition forces, right? So there was a, I mean, accommodation this, which became separatists if you go from Booker T. Washington to Garvey, for example, and then on to the 60s, right? So you had that. And then you had this integrationist thing, which didn't even at the beginning sort of exist, but in sort of a form until Du Bois questions the NAACP and then it gets formed as a more government, corporate, elite-friendly framework. But obviously, the boys is part of this particular uh, class in a sense of its education, the status and stuff, right? So what the real elephant in the room is, if you will, that they're sort of not discussing here is what was the actual fight over in the first place? And that's what the boys brings up. And if you boil it down, it was always about political, civil and political rights, right? And obviously inc included in that is economic rights, right? What later gets framed as almost immediately once it's available uh, you remember that I, I put up the thing about the boys appeal to the world. That's when he came back to the NWCP. So this happened even before Malcolm. Human rights. So it went from civical, civil and political rights when you had the U.S. framework to work within. As soon as the international framework came onto the table, it became rearticulated through human rights that apply to groups regardless of where they're, they're located. So it wasn't just an issue with the Constitution anymore. It was an issue now with the international laws and the Constitution, right? That was, was always what was at stake. It was a human rights violations. You have to be very clear about those human rights violations and civil and political right violations against black people. It wasn't discrimina discrimination. It was the law did not apply to them in the same way that the law applied to everybody else or was starting to apply to everybody else. Okay, that was always the the, the main issue and these controlled opposition groups came in to say well hey white people are never going to give us this anyway so let's just separate which solves nothing because they're not they don't give it to africans either in africa they don't give it to anybody anywhere so why the heck are they going to give it to you if you separate or build your own state you're not israel there's no there's no i mean you could be right so if if, if they gave Liberia to Garvey, say, and he wanted to be Netanyahu. I mean, you couldn't put it past them to, 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 to consider that, just like they consider neocolonialism everywhere else, which is the second thing I want to address, neocolonialism. People already understood the threat of neocolonialism. No one was confused about the fact that you can't just put black people in power and expect that it's just work just because you put black people in power, which is sort of kind of what they're arguing, but not kind of getting to the point of the fact that, I mean, that didn't confuse anybody really at the time. What they, they knew what they were fighting for, and they knew what the result could be in the co-optation of uh in a controlled opposition right it's just there was particular elements within this black power being one of them that kind of obfuscated that right because that was part of it right or nation nation of islam Th these type of separatist type idea ideologies within when this movement was kind of taking you away from the point the liberal assimilationists, they call it integration, but it's really a simulationist, certain black people who said we're perfectly okay with being part of this capitalist system, right? Who weren't even, who didn't even really in, in, in any type of essence represent a leadership class in the talented 10th category, which is very important to understand because they will use the talented 10th improperly. Like I said, this is why you, they don't want you reading the boys. Because then you might understand what the talented 10th was actually about and understand that 
what developed had nothing to do with that, but they'll still use the phraseology in order to get you con convinced that they, the boys imagined somehow this, these groups of people who just basically work for the government directly, right? Because that's basically what was happening. That's where the, where the pressure was coming from was corporations, the government, et cetera, as far as, you know, how Walter Wright or White or anybody else was handling the situation with the boys or however else, right? Or how the colleges and universities was hand, was handling how they treated them and stuff like that, right? And it's like, just like they were taking us passports and, and taking our passports and doing all this weird stuff behind the scenes, right? All of that was connected to, to these operations that were going on. And he controlled opposite operations, but it had to do with the, the civil, political, and human rights that the people were trying to obtain, right? So anything that anything under that, and they'll mention, and, and this is another thing to, to, to mention as well, is that they're trying to, to get into the, the like, like the, the social democracy versus racial right and center people like A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin who were themselves potentially part of these operations. You understand? They served the bourgeois socialist agenda for the black community in a sense, right? Because the government knew when they're marching on Washington and they call it for jobs and economic opportunity that they're never given any economic opportunity. They knew after they killed Martin Luther King and had Ralph Abernathy take over his position uh, of the uh, Southern uh, Christian Leadership um, Conference or whatever and do the Poor People's March. That at that point, it was dead anyway. And it, this wasn't going to do anything, right? It was, it was controlled at that point, right? Right. So they knew what these particular frameworks of this class, using this class stuff, what was going to happen, right? They knew during FDR already where they reluctantly had him, um, you know, when the, get the new deal done, right. Or, or against their will, get the new deal done that they were going to have to correct this over time. Right. They knew when they had JFK assassinated and LBJ installed as the president that they were going to carry out these particular agendas that, that uh, JFK wasn't going to maybe start pushing back on. Right. The whole assassination campaign that kicked off the war in Vietnam and all the other stuff, uh, crimes that they committed, right? That maybe maybe JFK was starting to question and starting to be like, hey, you know, you got these groups out here that's controlling the government, like the, like the right wing called like the deep state, these um, the CIA, FBI, all these other type of groups that are trying to operate rogue of the government and basically use the president as like a puppet leader where they behind the scenes work with corporations and all these other entities in control to control every all the, like the result of everything that's happening. Right. So I'm going to go and um, this video is probably something I'm going to reshow when we talk about the nationalist aspect, because this ties in right to like the black power nationalist stuff too, because the critique of, but it shows you what people's views were back then. And I'm going to start it here where they're talking about whether or not white people are, um, like serious about the rights. Next we asked, do you think that most whites in this country do or do not want complete equality for Negroes? I doubt very seriously that, that a, a white person would want to accept me as an equal today. I mean, they say they, I have a, a, quite a few white friends that say they would accept me as an equal, but when it comes right down to, to it, I can ask one if he would accept me as a son-in-law or accept me as a neighbor on an equal basis. And I doubt very seriously if he could answer me truthfully and say yes and mean it. The majority of Negroes, 67%, say whites do not want complete equality between the races. So it seems that most Negroes do agree with the contention of black separatists that whites are unsympathetic to Negro problems and do not want racial equality. It's difficult to see how this opinion could prevail without some feelings of resentment, anger, even hatred. But does this mean that the majority of Negroes are ready to turn their backs on white society and accept the doctrine of black separatism? Some blacks are demanding a separate nation for Negroes outside the United States. Others 
like the leader of the African Nationalist Partition Party, the self-styled Chief Ogunche, want a nation for blacks carved out of this country. Uh, the states that the party has selected, if you will, uh, I can call your attention to the map here, is uh, the 12 original uh, Confederate states uh, of this country. Essentially, we consider those people as living on uh, the trespasses. Uh, they've been living there to a great extent uh, through the benevolence of our people. So it's now that we feel that our people should take stock of situations as they are uh, and analyze it uh, and demand that these people remove themselves from that area in order that we might set up our uh, government there and, of course, in final analysis, form our nation. Two questions in our CBS News survey dealt with proposals for a separate nation for black Americans. We asked, is a separate country for black Americans outside the United States a good idea or not a good idea? I think this is going to become important when we talk about the nationalism and stuff. An overwhelming majority of Negro Americans say a nation for blacks outside the United States is not a good idea. And only 5% approve. You, you think, right, this is 1968, this is very important, 1968. So this is before the, this is not before Black Power, but this is before a lot of, um, I mean, this is about the same time as a lot of the the major events connected happen in terms of going, you know, down in the opposite direction, right? So you would assume that at this point in time, that there would be more than five percent of people, right? This is like when Malcolm Malcolm X said, or the boys said about the Garveyite movement was being overblown. And then when Malcolm said the nation of Islam membership was being overblown, the black power, like, uh, you know, nationalist separatist type stuff was being overblown. And still to this day, it pretty much is. Well, what about a separate country for Negroes within the United States? This idea was opposed by about the same majority. 87% said no. Some typical comments of disapproval. A okay, this is important against the uh, separate, as far as people understanding the issue on that. Like I said, this is going to be more relevant to the, the nationalists, so I probably might have to show this again when I do that. A separate Negro company is out of a question. We all got to live here in this world, all of us, and it's impossible for this world to be separated. Impossible. I think it's horrible. I think it's the worst thing that they can really set up. We're asking for equality. How can you have equality setting up a state of your own? Uh, I feel that we will lose more uh, by separating than we will uh, if we plan for total integration or if we fight for total integration. Uh, I don't believe in the separated states, no. The 6% of Negro adults in the nationwide CBS News translates into thousands which Negroes now are opposed to the idea of a separate black nation. But do they support the militant concept of complete political and economic control by Negroes of black communities within our society? Do they agree, for example, with the statement of the... So this is going to start talking about black power. Reverend Albert B. Kleeg, Jr. of Detroit, who told us what blacks want. He wants control of black communities. That's why the word black power is meaningful to black people and frightening to white people. Black power means the power to control your own destiny. That's what black people want. They want to control the community, the economics of the community, the politics of the community. We're tired of having white representation, you know, represent us downtown in city government. We're tired of having white merchants take care of our business. We're tired of having white teachers in our schools, white principals, white administrators. We want all of this to be, to be black. Okay. So another thing to keep in mind here, that this is like mainstream news. So that that's another thing to keep in mind. How this might be skewing, like as far as a, a, a narrative. But nonetheless, I think the data and stuff still speaks for, you know, what it is. Are you in favor of black control of black communities? Our CBS point. News survey put that question to a cross-section of American Negroes nationwide. The answer, about half of black Americans say they... So half opposed. Now watch this. This is, this, is, this, is, this is very important. They are not in favor of black control of black communities. 22% of American Negroes... 
right you see this like imbi- like the uh, kind of ambivalence around this because people knew right even the people in favor of it knew the sketchiness of what they was getting into right I support this idea why do the majority of Negro- like pe- people knew the neo the neo colonial aspect that could ha- that could happen right and they'll, they'll explain this right Grows oppose it. What we're concerned with is proper representation. Right, proper representation. And uh, if a white man is able to better represent a Negro or a black man, then this is the person we should have to represent us. If a black man is the best representative we have for not only the blacks, but for the whites or for any other ethnic group, then this is the man that we should have. What I feel is this, I can work with any white man, any white man can work with me, if he respects me and I respect him. Now, for example, what I'd like for my people to have is not black control, but power in their community to do the things that are right, to do the things that are necessary to see that their children get a basic education. Now, you take that suit you have on, no black man produced that suit. You take the shoes you wear, no black man produced that. You take that tie you have, no black man produced that. What we must do is become producers, and then when we become producers, we will have power. What I would like to see is in the black communities that there be white and black ownership or black and white ownership, and together we work to make the funds that are necessary to give us the community the schools, the churches, the homes that we need. So the real problem there is there was already the recognition of what like the goals were. So you can't then look back and like try to blame black power when statistically most people were either outright opposed to it or skeptical of the errors within it already. So it's like, wasn't well, this this magic thing that the government somehow, you know, like co-opted afterwards, right? Or that, that people were actually believing that the possibility didn't exist and just got blindsided by the fact that, hey, you could just put a black person in power who doesn't have any like kind of interest, but their own self-interest, right? That was understood. That was very understood, very well understood, and even articulated by people who were interviewed during this time period. So you you can't have the conversation without sort of recognizing that, like, you can critique black power all you want to, but you can't pretend that just the the, the incorrect you know assessment of black power, whatever government operation was behind it, whatever controlled opposition oper- operation was behind it, is somehow at fault when the goal, the overall goal in general, was this something this very specific, right? And you can't you can't divide these up and just into these binaries so you can ignore the elephant in the room, like I said, of the human rights violations and the civil rights of viola- uh, uh, political right violations, right? And what you had happen during this time period was, was how I would say was you had these groups pushing this way, which can now be blamed as they're being blamed today for this deviation, even though that deviation was already pre-planned. In addition, you had the other people. Pre- uh, controlling the opposition from the other side from the quote unquote uh assimilationist integrationist aspect to get these rights particularly you know knowing already again like i said knowing already beforehand that this wasn't actually going to come to anything i mean some of them some of them probably um you know was being genuine obviously some of them probably did get blindsided who were part of that movement but that's the whole point of controlled opposition is it doesn't matter if it's uh you know, unwittingly or whether or not there's, you know, willing participation or whether or not you're actually an agent, if you can function that way to the government, they don't really care the difference, right? They don't really care. So you got these two controlled opposition movements that all converge to the same thing. And the actual like root, like issue of the, the time period, right? Of what, you know, people are actually trying to fight for can just get left in the dust. And then still to this day, we have this binary of controlled opposition narrative taking precedent over the actual narrative that existed within the history, right? Where we're still talking about it in terms of, well, the black power versus the, you know, people who were fighting for this social thing, right? Like I said, the March on Washington, Bayard, Rustin, and uh, Ada Philip Randolph was behind a lot of this stuff, right? So even if you take that, that was a coalition uh, between the traditional liberal Democrats and 
the uh, social d democrat. So you can't really split those things up necessarily, right? Right. That's the whole point of controlled opposition. That's why I said there's more than one side, obviously, right? Because the point of controlled opposition, the point of bourgeois socialism, was to corral that back in, right? It was like when I had, uh, if you had a discussion, which this could come up, of like Obama versus Bernie Sanders, right? It doesn't matter how you corral them back into the Democratic Party as long as you corral them back into the Democratic Party or as long as you give the illusion to people that the Democratic Party viability, either with black people or uh, the Democratic viability, e even with you know people who are poor or looking for a specific, particular type of class benefits, right? Like healthcare or um, Medicare for uh, Medicare for all is healthcare or student loan debt forgiveness or any of these other things that you know for a fact that you're not going to, want to give them. I and they knew at the time of the March on Washington that they weren't going to give any black people any jobs or opportunities, even though they called it the March on Washington for jobs and opportunities. And the, the government was sort of working with the protesters to kind of organize it to make it kind of a, a nice little show event. Results of our CBS News survey on the question of black control of black communities are corroborated by the recent survey of the president's and 15 Negro out and most said the equality go to achieve their objective. Of 11 of these and respected king, uh, but an open society. Uh, Whitney Young, executive director of the National Urban League. Uh, what we are seeking, I, I would think, is not uh, integration, uh, but an open society where people have the freedom of choice and the options that every other American has. If they choose to remain in segregated neighborhoods, uh, then I think they have a perfect right to do so without the concurrent uh, inferior services and facilities necessary. Okay. There was some discussion that I was going to have about the lack of connection to the working class, but I think I already made that point. Um, because a lot of times you'll see the, these talks around this class thing but it's sort of like, like it's sort, it's sort of like, well, what's preventing you from the class? Like, where's the disconnect where you're arguing for these this class coalition, but then you can't build it, right? And just like I mentioned, where the where this the apologetics exists, I mean, the, the apologetics isn't isn't doesn't exist for these black leadership classes but or the elites or whatever you want to call them but then magically it exists for um it exists for the white people right so you kind of see what's going on here right like i said especially in the context of you know uh this coming like after like the pro reparations type movements and stuff like that you see the context of where like the the brunt or, or like the like the huge like negative aspect and blame is going towards a particular group while it could kind of alleviate the kind of anxiety of the white middle class group right right because i doubt the target audience like i said i doubt the target audience is poor people at all the target audience seems to be middle class white people and other blacks of the same category college educated that are kind of you know hiding behind like the the, the language to protect their class position from the opposite perspective, right? Just like I said, it is a controlled opposition, right? So we need the group of the Clyburns of, I mean, whomever else to, pro to, to protect Obama, right? To protect Obama's legacy, to protect the Clintons, right? You need the uh, John Lewis and then like the Clyburn a second time around. So when, when Hillary Clinton was running, you need the John Lewis to come and say, Hillary, you know, was there, I didn't see Bernie you know, during whatever time period or whatever racial struggles. And you need the Clyburn to vouch for a Biden. And then, you know, to over, over Bernie, right? So you could use the racial aspects against, you know, that class aspect, but through the controlled opposition side, you could have Bernie just totally a whip like dropping the, the ball on the race issue and it's perfectly okay for him to st stand here and make all these mistakes with his campaign and stuff like that but i mean as much as fault as you could blame john lewis or whomever else for bernie doing 
poorly with black folks or because of you know the the, the language or rhetoric they ever, ever used about structural racism in order to kind of undermine this social democratic campaign at the same time you have to be able to put blame on bernie sanders and like this is the part of the video i'm not going to show but this is the implications of what they started to argue at a particular point right you have to put the same blame on bernie sanders for fumbling fumbling the ball on the race thing and i've seen so many people who were part of bernie's campaign come out and, and like because at, at a certain point, I was like, man, this dude can't be that dumb. You could obviously see they're putting people on television to make South Carolina always, in both elections they did this, but the first one was obvious. I turned on CNN one day, and randomly you see Bakari Sellers, you see uh, Angela Rye on CNN talking, you know, very much not in uh, an unbiased way with regard to the Hillary Clinton campaign and Bernie Sanders campaign. It was perfectly clear that they had a particular group of, of, of black people trying to argue that every black person didn't support Bernie Sanders when it was obvious on the ground and in neighborhoods that black people supported Bernie Sanders. And like, I've seen older black people, I've seen younger black people, I've seen all types of different people. A lot of people supported Bernie Sanders, right? But you have to convince people in their minds, right? And they're not getting any of this type of analysis. We knew at that point in time, right? Like the Bernie stuff, I can't do like a whole video on what happened in 2016. But we knew the election was rigged. We knew the election was like rigged in 2020. So all they had to do was convince people that black people weren't going to vote for Bernie. And then after you rigged the election, then you could just blame black people and say the reason why Bernie didn't win was black people. The issue was by 2020, once Bernie already turned his back and or you already knew his true colors after he um, dropped out and endorsed Hillary Clinton during 2016, you already knew what was going on. If you didn't already know before, most people already knew what was going, what the operation was going to be, but whether or not you could have interfered, my argument was whether or not you could have interfered with the operation and put your own foot on the on, on the gas pedal as far as controlling your own you know aspects of that, that campaign and what was going on and put your own propaganda in there like Julian Assange and others tried to do and got got totally, you know, they, they, they killed the one kid, um, the rich, Seth Rich, um, allegedly. We'll just say allegedly. They not so much allegedly tried to kill Julian Assange and put him in prison. That's not even alleged. That's just that just happened, right? Over trying to put their 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 two cents into the to the race, right? They called us Russian bots for years before us trying to put our foot, like like I said, in into the to, into the race and make our own uh, political campaigns, online campaigns, propaganda campaigns to try to get through certain particular your, your spaces. Meanwhile, you have all these black people in Bernie's campaign saying, hey, you should pay more attention to this. You should pay more attention to that. You pay more attention to that. And him just saying, no, 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 no. But then, then when the, he gets blamed for not getting black support, then all of a sudden it's on black people. It's not on him for not doing anything within his campaign that his advisors, black advisors were telling him to do or the, whoever else was telling him to do it, right? Around reparations or anything else, right? Like you can't drop the ball on reparations, especially if you don't even expect to be president, right? Like if you had no chance of winning, there's literally zero chance why. There's literally zero reason, right? If you're going to use the argument that, for example, because these people supported Bernie Sanders. I mean, I'm not sure about Pascal, but I know uh, Adolf Reed did in 2020, right? So if you're going to use the excuse that, oh, well, we just wanted to get these democratic I socialist ideas out in Medicare for all, why the heck wouldn't you want to get the reparations idea out there then? Why the heck wouldn't you want to go big on reparations? You're not going to be elected anyway. So you could lie about getting Medicare for all. You could lie about getting student loan debt relief. You could lie about, um, you know, all these other reforms, prison reforms, while you know for a fact that as soon as the Democrats are going to get, get, get elected, they're going to give all this money to police officers and they're going to give all this money to militarize the police just like Obama did. You know, you know, COVID, using COVID as an excuse, but you know exactly what they're going to do with that. It's going to get worse like it did. Um, Biden didn't really do much of anything. So you, you already knew all this stuff, right? So why couldn't you just come in there and lie about the reparations thing? Just lie then, if that's what it's all about. But that didn't happen, obviously, for an obvious reason, right? <laughs> so you can't get all this blamed specifically to, um, you know, uh, black people or these race, this one side. That's, that's purely controlled opposition. It's purely controlled opposition, as I hope that I've, I've shown. You say one of the, sure. uh, bring attention to one small, small thing before that. So I did, I, mean, I don't know if you saw this, if you didn't, like I'll send it to you when we get off. Um, but I did an article back in the summer uh, called the whole, uh, the whole country is the Reichstag. 
right? And it's an argument about how how grave I think you know, the actual danger of an authoritarian or slash fascist takeover is. And one thing that drives me crazy about leftists, and by the way, I don't really associate with them either. Um, and I'm mean, least of all politically, but is that, that there's this tendency, especially among you know, academic sorts, uh, that once the prospect of fascism comes up to jump into trying to taxonomize whether uh, you know, current uh, expressions of the dangerous right wing qualify for the fascist label on that, then people. Okay, that's not what's done. I mean, I'm not sure certain people would probably do that. But the issue with the fascism thing is that's just how capitalism operates. So you basically have all these people who call themselves Marxists hiding behind this, this like the errors of Marx to perpetuate capitalism, who have literally either no idea how capitalism actually functions, didn't actually study Marx, or just don't care and just kind of using it for their own own ways because that's just the way capitalism functions in terms of um creating these controlled opposition i mean that's just a feature the controlled opposition i wouldn't say like the other otherization like i mentioned before is um i mean that's definitely a tactic but you're going to have to if you want to control power within any situation control the people who might be opposed to you right so there's particular narratives and particular oppositional groups that you have to filter into particular ways and means and categories, right? And that's not even just to either even control actual opposition, right? That's just to control society generally, right? Because you know, you might not, because it might be groups that you might not even expect to be revolutionary, right? It might just be groups that you need to filter in to be your warriors to protect the system, right? Ideologically, they might not do anything physically. But you might need to, them to ideologically have a particular view that protects the system. And in, in, in terms of how they argue with other people, in terms of how they articulate views that get uh, proliferated and, and become pervasive. So the issue with fascism is it doesn't describe anything. It just doesn't describe anything. Right? If you look at the, down the list of things like, they, they usually, and I discussed this in another video, if you look down the list of things, like, there's they, supposed to be fascism, you're like, oh, well, capitalism, check, 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 check. All that stuff already existed before the term fascism even existed. The controlled opposition socialist groups is, is already an inherent aspect, right? Like I said, I mean, what made Bernie Sanders much different than Hitler, right? If, if Bernie Sanders would have became president and, you know, threw the black people under the bus and all the black people would die then just to, uh, to get some form of, you know, that socialism that the U.S. supported or FDR, for example, right? If he didn't get rid of lynching or, you know, any of these type, this type of stuff, then black people continue to die and continue to be victims. Same thing with LBJ. If he didn't, if uh, you know, he just starts this assassination campaign and all of a sudden, you know, years later, you know, uh, moving forward, you got all these other people dropping dead. You know, all these black leaders dropping dead. All these black uh, political, you know, opponents, uh, entire organizations are being shredded. The entire black communities falling victim to Vietnam, to the eventual war on drugs and all this other stuff. I mean, it just pretty much is what it is, right? You can't just go, go look at, you know, a controlled opposition movement specifically in either Italy or Germany, where the United States government, the British government had tremendous influence on what was going on over this time period from where uh, Germany was hit with all these restrictions after World War One to the point of where they're not even supposed to be having, you know, weapons or making this type of industrialized push, but all these weapons and industrialization has happened to a minority group within the country who is illegally taking power within the country, the Nazis, who are just randomly appointed to the, the head of state and randomly supported by all these, you know, American corporations. Even though we every, everybody knew exactly what was going on, what the exact, exact purpose was, obviously anti-communism, and um, eventually, you know, this war with the Soviet Union, right? So you you get all this stuff, you know, happening, right? Just for you to come today and say X Y Z is fascist, and what that's you to this this I want to reverse this real quick because I'm telling I want to tell you what the real is, what's really happening is remember how I said in the first one how they use these ideological moral frameworks to underlie people's thought patterns 
to then uh, attack angles of controlled opposition, right? So if you present Trump, for example, as fascist, and you already have the ideology of consequentialism stating that you need to reduce this harm that exists within society, and fascism is defined as a particular harm to particular groups of people, then you have to stop this Trump. In order to stop this Trump, then you just come back and insert the lesser of two evilism of Hillary, of Biden, who then go on to do the exact same things that you said that you was you needed to stop Trump from doing. Or Bush to Obama. Or, you know, Goldwater to you know, or whoever else to Johnson or whoever, whatever election, just insert the election. We need to stop this guy because he might do what this guy's going to do anyway if he gets elected. And that's the same thing with the fascism stuff. Like capitalism's not going to take a different direction. <laughs> if capitalism was going to take a different direction, they JFK the president. Right? That's the only other different direction it could take. It's already took all the worst directions that it could possibly take. Once the question arises as something to think about, then we're well past the point of taxonomizing it. And the only thing that they do is to, uh, that, that, that there is to do is to try to figure out ways to fight against it. Right. And I've, and I've been, well, then when, when we, what do you have been well upon that point, that point, I think the point where Europeans went to Africa and started enslaving people and came to the United States and started genociding people. And then, you know, started genociding the people they were enslaving. At any given one of these points in history, you could have been like, hey, man, this, this is probably getting kind of bad. We shouldn't taxonomize it. We should just probably figure out how to end it. So why are you waiting until 1930 or 20 to, to or the teens or whatever, you know, this stuff, this stuff, you know, wherever you want to try to pinpoint it starting out at to then, to then say, you know, oh, now we need to start thinking about this other stuff, right? Because we're just supposed to have like a, a, a historical memory that just kind of evaporates, and then now we're supposed to, we're we're in, in this all about you know this this fascist formation of Trumpism, which is being funded by Democrats and their elect their you know appointed officials in the FBI and CIA and all these other uh, military industrial organizations who they're giving weapons to, like in Ukraine for example, right? We know who funds the quote unquote fascism. We know where the weapons come from. We know where the motivation comes from. We know where the ideology comes from. We know where the resources come from. We know, you know, how the, the stuff gets proliferated. Like, I mean, it's come on. I'm convinced that we aren't. You know, this type of stuff is for people who have literally no clue what's going on. You no, know, um, I put it someplace like one, 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 one night oversleeping away from missing a fascist coup, right? Uh, or an authoritarian coup. So, and I'm like JFK. I mean, we're well past, like, at what point were we well past that, right? Like, the elections are rigged now, right? Trump was probably correct in saying that he was a victim of a coup. And they had that fake coup organized by government, you know, employees and, you know, FBI officials and agents and plants and agent provocateurs that did the, the January 6th fake nonsense to try to discredit a lot of the other stuff and run kind of like a a simulated, you know, um, operation, basically, an in-game simulation of what would happen in this potential situation, right? I mean, come on. We're, we're well past the point of worrying about a coup, but we have, I mean, there's been so many already in U.S. history. That that's where my principal concern is now. So um, I want to pause this for a second, go take a break, and then I'm going to come back and I'll finish the rest of this last video. Okay, this should be it right here to finish up. I got my notes on this last part of the video, I think. We should be able to go over this video. And then be pretty much done with it. I got where I'm starting out at. Classism, elitism, 
and I'm glad Janice said that. Most black people are too focused on the boule and at the tenant association leaders and section eight housing. There's a very, let me tell you why that's a very important statement. Because today when black people are just starting today to realize that they may have, they may have class enemies, they, re, they, they reduce the whole phenomenon to, oh, it's the boule Negroes, the boule Negroes. First of all, three quarters of the, the, the folks that you're talking about who are, you believe, selling black folk out are probably likely not in the boule or haven't known a person in the boule. Yeah. So this is what we call a clear equivocation fallacy if it wasn't for the fact that I also believe that he has no clue what he's talking about. Okay. So first of all, if I, if I tell somebody, okay, like in a general sense about this was the fault of COINTELPRO or something like that, right? You know that I mean government operations against particular groups of people. You know that I might not mean specific operations, right? So then if you go and make the argument, I think I said I think I already said this, but I'll go ahead and say it again. So if you make the argument then that no, that wasn't uh COINTELPRO, that was MK Ultra, or that was uh, you know, chaos or something like that, or that was some other, you know, name that specific specific to a specific operation. Well, you, you know what the pe- the people are talking about, right? So when, for one thing, the people don't say, and, and, uh, okay, for one thing, this is not new, okay? Black people didn't wake up yesterday and realize that Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, like I've already mentioned, like that was a long time ago. This is 20, this is the end of 2020 video, right? This is the end of the year show for 2020. And he said that people are just now starting to realize. No, like who, who's just now starting to realize? Because when, when Tupac, he called his last album Columinati because in prison, or I think it was when he went to prison, they were in there talking about the Illuminati. <laughs> and obviously, it's well past 2020, well before 2020, you'd had, you know, black people talking about, you know, Jay-Z or Beyonce or Oprah or some of these other people in Illuminati. So you know, you know it, they're using terms like the Illuminati. If anybody's using terms like the Illuminati and Boule Illuminati, I heard that I heard that phrase used exactly like that, Boule Illuminati. Right? You know what they're talking about. Now you could, if you want to educate people and say, no, it's not Boule Illuminati. It's this specific secret society. It's this specific, and you want to kind of lay it out like that. But if you want to deny that you know for one deny that people was he was even talking about this before so recent, no people's been talking about this and then and then you you don't want to deny just their knowledge of it you want to deny the the knowledge of like any thing specifically right you want to den- deny that that even constitutes a, a, a claim basically you want to invalidate their their uh articulate articulation or expression Right, you want to uh, uh, invalidate their expression for lack of articulation, basically. Right, that's that's an, another thing that I wanted to discuss that I haven't gotten to yet. Uh, in another video, I was going to discuss that when I was going through my notes, I kind of forgot to mention it. But there's a difference between expression and articulation. This is very important when you consider the fact that not everybody who's able to recognize a phenomenon or whatever or recognize phenomena in general, uh, as far as, you know, X, Y, Z is going on, know how to properly articulate it. And that, that's like the divide, right, between, you know, like an academic or a scholar or intellectual or philosopher or whatever else, right? That That's like the divide, right? It's not that, you know, people can't tell what's going on. The people know what's going on. They just might not be able to explain exactly what's going on in sophisticated language, for example, but they know what's going on. So if someone says, you know, it's the boule, but you're like, oh, no, it's not the boule because, you know, technically they're not in it. Like if someone's not in it, like, for example, and this is going to come up, 
when it's the boys, then it's all of a sudden, oh, the talented 10th, the talented 10th, even though what he's talking about has nothing to do with the boys' concept of the talented 10th, which isn't even the boys' what is wasn't even the boys' concept in the first place. He borrowed it. So if you're going to take that out of context to demonize, you know, someone who's actually, you know, went very far to providing intellectual frameworks for how we understand, you know, white supremacy and capitalism and imperialism and all this other, you know, very important stuff to, you know, liberation and very important stuff to just un like sociology and just, you know, general philosophy understanding, then why are you going to pro pro provide that same, you know, why, why are you like like what, what, where's the consistency right you're not going to apply it to yourself but then these people will say in boule then all of a sudden because they're not technically talking about the, the boule they're talking about black fraternities in general they're talking about elite black people in general when they say boule like that's just a catch-all term a catch-all phrase basically you know but you know what they're talking about but you're trying to invalidate what they're saying and, and, and like i said also you're trying to um like, pretend that they, they this isn't something that people have been talking about for a while have been talking about so um right and you're going to see like the contradiction that i just mentioned come up where and, and you're going to see why he has an issue with people saying boule as a for fraternities because that's his where he's coming from right that's a that's a personal hit when they say it's these these boule because they're it's actual critique of what he's actually doing right their whole life Okay, they may be in a fraternity or sorority. The majority of fraternity or sorority people are not in the boule. Small percentage of them are, but that doesn't mean that there are not other social mechanisms that exist within the black community that were considered uplift movements, like the National Urban League, that don't have class consequences as toxic as as many of those other organizations that we've had in the black community. And this is not me just trying to say, oh, the National Urban League is toxic. Well, if you read in some of the behaviors documented in Torre's book, in terms of what they were doing with white landlords and agreements they had as to what kind of black folk got housing, you might be very shocked. And by the way, as someone who's a member of one of these fraternities and sororities, what was most appreciative, what, what I appreciate most about this book is that one of the things that my fraternity <laughs> prides itself on is that every president of the National Urban League except one has been a member of my fraternity. The National Urban League is literally, you can say, an ideological outgrowth of my fraternity's project. So if this is the ideological outgrowth of the oldest black so it's self-critique without self-critique. My fraternity in America, it can be an healthy bit of projection. Indication that the talented tenth uplift move. See, the talented tenth uplift movement, right? What, what the heck does that have to do with anything? And I, I like I've seen this a lot over and over again when when it, people describe Du Bois as boule, which. It is extremely mi misleading, but actually has, you know, an actual issue with it, right? Because describing him as that would describe these nefarious activities that um might, one might say is pervasive. W they're arguing is pervasive and not necessarily nefarious, but at least self-interested when Du Bois was out there arguing against that type of activity. He was out there arguing against it. Like, literally the first time that someone said the boys is boule, I was like, what the heck is that? What, what, what are they talking about? I looked up, just Googled the boys boule. And, you know, one of the articles that I looked up and read was an article explaining how the boys went to the boule and basically, you know, was yelling about how they weren't, you know, respecting you know, what, their, the privilege that they had in the community and utilizing that privilege to help, you know, the rest of the black community, right? So literally the opposite of just doing the self-interest, he was like just totally ripping them for doing that. You know, what it ended up becoming, right? What, what, what these organizations ended up producing, he was totally against. 
So then trying to tie it back to pretend that that's what he was for. I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know what kind of kind of slight that's supposed to be. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it goes along with the rest of the stuff I said, right? Because obviously, you can't argue that at the beginning he had that idea, right? The only thing you could argue is that his improper, um, his, his lack of being able to see see like the in foresight that this was going to happen, right? And then in hindsight, he realizes, oh, well, I see how it evolved. But once he saw how it evolved completely differently than how he had imagined he ref he like he he was opposed to it immediately it wasn't like it wasn't like you know this like uh, like they're trying to describe here so i mean it's just kind of crazy but then when someone you know who's not even you know in academic circles probably the people that are talking about most of the people i talk about who's talking about boulet i mean they're not even academic circles um they're not they're just people you know wh who articulate in the idea that there are certain you know black people a part of particular you know projects that don't have black interests generally that have you know interests more in line with you know upper class or upper like middle class um bourgeois politics so movement project that we still cling on may have a lot more between the weeds that very few of our scholars are interrogating because we're taught to look at black history with this kind of vindication. It was like, look, there's Booker T. Washington. He was wonderful. Look, there's W.B. Du Bois. He was wonderful. Look, there's Malcolm X. He was right. And there's the automatic slight at Du Bois, right? Right. No context whatsoever is a slight that um, the boys can't be considered wonderful. It needs to be brought down. It was wonderful. Like how he, like, like, like somehow the boys is comparable to, you know, the, the, the things that people are critiquing today, right? Like, like I said, he was going to do that, right? With the boys, is he, he can't be viewed as wonderful. But then when people say boule, then obviously that's clearly wrong. Then, um, you know, you can't point out that it's the boule. You have to, like, what? And, and, and we just forget all the critiques that people already had of, you know, Obama, Jesse Jackson, or Al Sharpton, or, um, you know, like people in entertainment, like Jay Z or whoever else, Oprah or wh wherever, you know, sports athletes, Michael Jordan. Forget the critiques that people had of Michael Jordan or LeBron or anybody, right? It's crazy. <clears throat> Without really interrogating, how did these figures actually function in the politics of their time, and what individuals actually worked with? financed them or in or intersected with them in ways that may not particularly be beneficial to the majority of working class black folk and why i'm very happy to have both of these brothers on is that not only Torre but particularly cedric they have a history of writing about african-american the cadre to speak a little bit about that, that project in their career work and why why and i've always said this i love black folk from louisiana and somebody asked me <laughs> no, I, i'm not dead serious i said i said louisiana brothers are basically exported haitians they knew when they know when black folk are screwing them over because we know that back home they have the same internal sense so they all before we get off <laughs> he actually played baseball wow. so i'll go first go for it, ricky henderson so I guess what I'll say about that, um, you know, a common misconception, and maybe maybe Ture has had the same experience. You know, whenever we make the class uh, analysis or offer the class analysis of Black life, um, one response you'll get from people to try to delegitimate what you're saying is they'll assume that the reason you're making that argument is either you're coming from some sort of right wing or conservative perspective, right? Or even worse, they'll challenge your legitimacy as a black person and question your authenticity, right? They'll wonder. Yeah, see, this is where the argument of authenticity, for, for first of all, who's making that that clean? Because that matters, right? Like, is this working class poor people? Or is this professional, you know, managerial class or whatever? 
that kind of matters as far as who's making the argument that of, of lack of authenticity. Because if someone, you know, from poor working class background is, is saying you don't have authenticity from that, that's completely different than authenticity as far as you're not going to HBCU or going uh, in, in these fraternities, right, that they were talking about. You like that authenticity, right? That's two different, completely different things. Whether or not you you grew up around black people and in black institutions, and the, and I'm always waiting for that when you're using the baseball analogy. That's like throwing it right down, you know, down the plate for me because that's how I came to the class analysis. It wasn't through, um, you know, through books. It was through actually being in black institutions and having grown up um, around black fraternities and sororities, being a part of a black fraternity. Mm -hmm. um, going and then, then you get the answer of what growing up around men. Going to an historically black college, uh, growing up in a black church, and witnessing my own town in South Louisiana be transformed from one that was governed by, uh, essentially by the old planter class in my hometown, mm -hmm. and how it was transformed into a black run town. And so um, between the 1980s up until now, We've had, I think, seven um, black mayors in my hometown. And so even as a teenager, I was, able to, I was able to watch up close and personal the ways in which the forms of ethnic politics that we're hearing again echoed in the wake of George Floyd's uh, murder uh, were insufficient, right? That they were limited, that you could actually see the problems of that even back in the 1980s right. when I was a teenager. Okay, see, that was 1980s. Remember, I showed you the video in the 1960s where people were already making that criticism. It didn't even happen yet, but they already knew what was going to happen, right? Or what, what was potentially able to happen, right? So it's, I mean, kind of making that that critique like that late, it's kind of like I don't know. It's like you you're like it's something that was already known. So people can like in con contemporary to those times. And then you you go, like you know, fifty years later, or more, and then now all of a sudden, you have to make the same critique again, as if the people at the beginning didn't know that was going to happen. And completely, like completely out of context. And even earlier, you know, in other cities. So, I think for me, um, I came to the analysis first on my own and in my own way. Uh, as a teenager, as somebody who was in black institutions, immersed within the black world of South Louisiana and the, the world that gripped the, the Interstate 10 corridor from Houston all the way across to Mobile, basically, is where my family was. Um, and then as an academic, you know, um, I remember making some arguments to my my dad, Michelle, for Vadov, having um, the travelers necessary now more than ever yeah, I think I'm, because we're living through a moment where thing I we're hearing the same arguments that were made uh, otherwise I yeah I, I can oh, yeah. echo almost everything cedric said i mean I, just like cedric i came to class analysis growing up in southwest atlanta and and i came to class analysis in 1980 and New Haven, Connecticut, right? My family's from New Orleans, um, and I spent my summers as a as a kid in New Orleans. But um, you know, my most of most of the days of my uh, early childhood life were, were spent in Southwest Atlanta. Which, uh, if you were familiar with um, uh, Ti's um, ATL, uh, that's that's where it's set. And while ATL is not the reason that Ti will burn in hell, that's Iggy Azalea. Right. Uh, it's a terrible movie, but anyway, I can never resist the opportunity to say that whenever I bring it up. Uh, but, but you know, one of my one so among the most significant memories that I have that kind of pushed me to think about the unfairness of the world that black people occupy, which is much the same unfair world that everybody else occupies. Okay, I think this is where he talks about this is going to be important. Was growing up in Atlanta during the missing murdered children. Uh, you know, crisis, right? And you could see then I was in grade school. Uh, and in fact, one of the, the kids who was murdered, Patrick Baltazar, 
who I didn't know personally, but we went to the same church. We were at the same uh, boys club. He was a year older than me. Um, you know, everybody in the city was, was, of course, touched by that, right? And kids were freaked out. And I was a kid, so I was freaked out. But, you know, you could see at the time, if you look through it, the class skew of the reactions to the, to the missing murdered children. And, and then, of course, uh, because the victims were disproportionately, uh, you know, they're all black boys, right? But they're disproportionately black boys coming from uh, you know, lower income backgrounds. And that profoundly shaped, I think, the response, like who the victims were in a city with a black mayor and a black police chief profoundly affected the response, right? Uh, and of course, once you got the sense that um, of what the motives were of the, of the, of the killer, uh, at least presumed killer, Wayne Williams, that too reflected the class sensibilities of the you know, serial killer in question, right? Uh, and growing up between Southwest Atlanta, where everybody was black, and New Haven, Connecticut, which is a majority black in Puerto Rican city, but, but a very poor city when I grew up there in the mid 80s. I had some experiences with the complexity of race and class in ways that were even more profound than the, than the much more heavily segregated Atlanta. Uh, and I got to witness, I didn't know any white people. I didn't have any white peers in Atlanta. Uh, teachers don't count. I had a... Okay, so that's sort of important where you said, and I'll go show this, right? So this is after Mindhunter came out, right? offers answers to America's tragedy at Black History Month event. Okay. I'm going to blow this up. And I'm assuming this article is at least somewhat accurate as far as what was said at this event. Because uh, I couldn't find the event online. If someone else can find it, maybe they can send it to me or post it in the comments or something. But it said Reed, who was working towards... This This is referring to Adolf Reed, not... Um, this, it was Torre who was just talking who was working as a, uh, toward a doctorate at Atlanta University during the time of the murders, believes the right person is behind bars. Okay. Makes the same point about the economic context. Moving on. Reed's son, Torrey Reed, is just, that was who was just talking. Um showed what it was like at the time. He, he too connected dots of class status, right? First and clearest window I had when the vulnerabilities engendered by poor, uh, or by, by poverty and inequality, and also made clear that your racial identity did not necessarily translate to decency, compassion. Yeah, okay. Well, that, okay, what he's talking about there is um, the, what he was talking about before which is that a lot of the people who were of maybe a higher class in Atlanta weren't sympathetic towards the victims, right? In fact, uh, this in case this case in fact shared racial identity helped uh, mask the evil intention of the serial killer. Okay, also right here, it says the conspiracy theory sought to make sense of the killers in a framework of old horror stories of white supremacist violence. Okay. And you, you heard it, it mentioned, I thought it was mentioned in this article too, but I couldn't find where he mentioned it here, but you will see the motivations that he was talking about. Okay, yeah, it says, for, for reference, Williams grew up in a black middle-class household, right? And he was talking about the intentions, you know, behind which, if you're not familiar with the case, okay, that was based on a lie. They made it up. So he's basing this framework, which I'm not sure. Okay, I can't speak to if he knows what happened versus he doesn't know. I, I, I'm not going to say that even matters in this situation. It probably, it probably does. I mean, it, it, I mean, it doesn't matter really because I don't re recall very many people who think that Wayne Williams actually did the killings. At least from my experience hearing people speak about it, 
they at least say they don't expect that he did all of them. There's no way. Or that he didn't do, he, he probably didn't do any of them. Right. First off. Right. So the, the notion that, that even from ignorance that the right person is in jail shows a blind spot related to that same class status, right? So he's basically doing what he's claiming that was done by Wayne Williams, right? It's a, it's a projection, right? One to Wayne Williams, his sympathies in a sense, right? Even unconsciously. And at least he was truthful about the fact that there was a class divide as far as, you know, what people thought, ha what people thought, you know, happened in, in their attitudes as far as how much they cared, right? But we know, at least for a fact now, that that, that was just that, the story of Wayne Williams um, being from a middle class family and despising the poor it was just made up. They just lied about it. They just made it up to, to try to uh, frame Wayne Williams because Wayne Williams was framed. We know more about the case, obviously, now. Now, you know, with the Internet and, you know, people were talking, you know, for a long time. I followed um, followed Dwayne Hendricks' podcast the, on the Atlanta uh, child murderers. It says it says that um, generally, it says uh, based upon research with assassins as well as other criminal types who generally fit the profile of this type of killer, this case is not an organized plot to kill small black children for the following reasons. These victims are very similar in appearance with few exceptions. These exceptions are being currently investigated and we will probably find that they are not related to the others. That is what you call institutional racism yeah, yeah. right that's, there. Where yeah, they that's say BS, black people aren't black people. Like that's, that is, yeah, that's all institutional. Yeah, because as and that goes against their profile status because you see a group of children, black children. And then you go back and John Douglas says that they're children. So, and Wayne stay in black and serial killers stay in their race. That hell no, that right there, that's BS. Whoever wrote that is BS, man. That, 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 uh, that's just, for, John for instance, the see oh my the god he, he contradicted himself i can't believe i'm saying this live recording okay listen only thing i was gonna say as a as a person who studied under him and who was at the bau i was just gonna say when you said he lied i was just gonna say what well, i wouldn't say he lied i'll just say that his his findings are 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 fallible but here bro look at what this says do not release information to any non-law enforcement personnel he's saying everything opposite of what he said in the public about wayne for the last 40 years he's like, also contradiction yeah. in what he wrote above where he's saying this you know uh, uh, blacks will only target blacks and then he's doing a psychological profile on the kids themselves let's say you giving him the benefit of the doubt yeah. And you saying he just had the wrong profile on Wayne. Mm -hmm. Why would he have in this file that he thinks the same person is the person that committed Oakland County? There's no way humanly possible Wayne was killing people in 1976 in Michigan, folk. And, and Wayne's arrest was based on John Douglas's profile. And all I'm saying is his profile was dead wrong, dead wrong. Right, but what I'm saying is that he's yeah. saying in these files that he thinks the person that perpetrated the murders in Oakland County is the same person that committed these murders in Atlanta. Yeah, and he was wrong. He was wrong. No, he he potentially is right about that. That oh. the person who was killing kids or the people that was killing kids oh, yeah, yeah, in yeah, Oakland yeah. County, Michigan yeah. was potentially the same people that was killing kids in Atlanta yeah. That's yeah. absolutely factual based on all of the similarities and the connections. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, he was from the fact from the, the from the from the from all the way down. Listen, all the way down to the dog hairs and the carpet fibers. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think the YouTube channel got taken down. It still has a Facebook page. Still has a uh, Twitter, I think. Or, or, and it was uh, at Kid Unleashed, right? And the amount of information that was released shows that that was wrong. It wasn't conspiracy theories related to white supremacist violence. There were known white supremacists involved. Um, at some point during the um, appeal process of Wayne Williams, uh, one of Wayne Williams's lawyers, um, Lynn Whatley, uh, came upon a, a f- copies from a file called the 8100 file. These documents describe an investigation into possible Ku Klux Klan involvement in some of these killings. Assistant Fulton County District Attorney Joe Drolet prosecuted Wayne Williams. He says he was never told about the Klan file. Do you think you should have known about it? Um, not particularly. It wasn't relevant at the time. The GBI had it. The police department had it. Two prosecutors had it. Two judges had it. If Lewis Slayton didn't have it, means he didn't want it. Wayne Williams is being represented in this hearing for a new trial by his former attorney, Lynn Watley, and two of this country's most prominent attorneys, Bobby Lee Cook of Somerville, Georgia, and William Kunstler of New York. The defense is trying to show that the police were investigating that the Ku Klux Klan may have been responsible for some of the child murders, but that that file was never turned over to help with Williams' defense. You know, a lot of records was intentionally destroyed by these agencies. They did want the public to know. He's right. We confirm that all audio recordings, including those wiretaps, were destroyed. When Wayne Williams was convicted of two, I said, oh, we quit. This is it. We can close it out. The GBI helped lead the original KKK investigation. A spokesperson says they destroyed the evidence once agents dismissed a link to the Klan. Documents also state that APD was also involved in the 8100 file. They told us, quote, our investigators have not encountered any files outlining KKK involvement. Larry also recalls details about the boy mentioned in the files, Luby Jeter, who one day bumped his go-kart into a Klan member's car. The first witness today, Billy Joe Whitaker, says he worked as a police informant during the missing and murdered investigation. Whitaker says he told police detectives that a Klansman from Mountain View, Charles Sanders, told Whitaker he killed one of the child victims, Luby Jeter. Well, I told him that I believe Charles Sanders, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, killed, uh, killed uh, this one kid named Jeter. Bobby Lee Cook and William Kunstler say they have a letter from Atlanta police major Herman Greiner that calls Sanders, the Klansman, the prime suspect in the murders, four months before Wayne Williams was arrested and charged with two of the murders. The black, at least that he's talking about, as far as, far as the mayor, had involvement in the cover-up. Vice President George Bush came to town, offering Mayor Maynard Jackson full federal assistance in dealing with the nightmare. And, according to attorney William Kunstler, Bush may have pressured the city to arrest Wayne Williams, even though the evidence was weak. Mayor Jackson denies it. He claims that neither Vice President George Bush nor Governor George Busby ever tried to bring pressure on him or anyone else in his administration. And we obviously know the federal government pressured, were the ones who put the pressure as admitted by one of the uh, the uh, sheriff's symbol or police officers involved, as the police officer sheriff, who said specifically, specifically stated that the federal government got involved to shut down the investigation. Precipitated that. Uh, Lewis Layton was a fine district attorney, a good friend of mine. Uh, he was under a lot of pressure to to prosecute Wayne Williams. When Wayne Williams was arrested. And if you do your research, you will find where Lewis Slayton says there's just not enough evidence, right? You nod your head so you know what I'm doing, I'm talking about. There's not enough evidence. And Lewis Slayton has always been a good prosecutor, had a good eye for prosecution. The local FBI agent who was assigned here at the time uh, went to Washington. And it is my understanding he talked to President, uh, I believe it was Vice President Bush, And uh, 
he uh, got in contact with um, the governor of the state of Georgia at that time. And uh, I understand that, that there was a message uh, uh, from, uh, from Washington that said uh, that either you prosecute or the attorney general will prosecute. Now, with your local politician, he could not, he couldn't handle that kind of pressure where the attorney general of the state of Georgia was coming to his jurisdiction and prosecute. So he had to do it. But that was a result of the meeting at the governor's mansion where information was passed down from Washington to our governor. And, 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 and this is what I understand happened. If, if he doesn't prosecute, uh, we're going to cut off all uh, uh, state, federal sharing, fund sharing with the state. And, and to prosecute Wayne Williams, who there was never any evidence was involved in any of it. In terms of our efforts tonight, we have not ended up with the information that would result in an arrest. That's about all we have to say at this point in time. We're not holding anyone. Nobody's under arrest. That is correct. No, he is not. Is he gone? But he has, he's free to leave whatever he wants to leave. We've gone over this before and you've stated it, but again, as of today, uh, is the impression still that it's, it's more than one person committing these crimes? It has consistently been our position based upon the evidence that we, we do not have a single person that has that is involved in the cases involving the children. Yet another um, a strong um, suspect, um, I, I believe, that it could have been explored as a suspect in this case, was a man named John David Wilcoxon. Three men arrested for operating a sex for hire ring that may have existed for 17 years. Jury in Wayne Williams' case never heard one word about any of these reports uh, made to the authorities, nor at John David Wilcoxon's trial on child pornography, in which he would end up uh, being convicted and going to prison, did the jury in that case hear about Earl Terrell and Luby Jeter. The Cab County investigators have been working on many theories, but one that is getting quite a bit of attention is the theory that the person responsible for one, maybe more of the murders, is homosexual. I think there have been homosexual indications that have shown up in some of the cases. Uh, by no stretch of the imagination can that be spread over the entire category. This is the house. We learned today that the FBI has been watching this house on Gray Street near Techwood Homes for the last three weeks. And we also confirmed today that the special task force is also watching the happenings here. Tom Terrell owns this house. He says he's a homosexual. I interviewed him on Friday. He told me that Larry Marshall, who is now in jail in Connecticut, knew Timothy Hill. His body was pulled out of the Chattahoochee River a week ago today. An investigator with a special task force interviewed Larry's former roommate, Jerry Thornton, today. The investigator had the pictures of 22 of the murdered children with him. Did he show you all 22 mm -hmm. pictures yeah. of all the kids? Yeah. How many of those kids have you seen before over at Larry's? I told him about 10 of them. 10 of them you recognized? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 10 of them, what did they used to do? Just come up there on the porch, they slayer for chains and shit, stuff <laughs> like that. Marshall was in jail here in Atlanta up until last July. That's when, according to Thornton, Marshall started hanging around with the children. Marshall has also been arrested in Atlanta for, among other things, running a house of prostitution. But Thornton says Marshall wasn't the only one who knew the murdered children. Mm -hmm. Did Tom know all those kids yeah. too? Tom yeah. Terrell did? Mm -hmm. and, and why did Tom know them all? Tom probably knew all of them. That is our position today. We know based upon the evidence. And we're looking at the data that we have at our disposal. We're looking at things such as the modus operandi, that is how people commit crimes. We, and based upon all of that, using our own experience in the field of law enforcement, 
the experience and opinions of those who have consulted with us, including other law enforcement agencies, our consultants, etc., we can say with certainty that we do not have one person responsible for the cases involving the missing and murdered children in our city. Right. So when your entire like framework is based on a complete lie that you have to come from a particular disposition to even buy the lie. I mean, because who, if for one, if you, if for people not familiar with the case, Wayne Williams was accused of killing two adults. And the way that they claimed to have found out was, or, you know, found him, right, was following him and cl a claim that, I don't even know who is here to substantiate that claim, that his that, that he that he stopped on the bridge, got out of his car, picked up a grown man freaking body, and freaking launched him over top of this freaking like the side of the uh the thing, and just and uh you know the police came, and they heard a splash, and then put and then went in the water and went got him. I mean, the entire story falls apart. The, the police statement, Wayne Williams had to have turned his lights off before he came to that rise. They never saw those lights. On the, on, that was their testimony. Never saw those lights uh, on, hit those trees. So that means he snuck on that bridge or snuck, he, he started sneaking about one and six tenths miles away. He then drove by Agent Gilliland's car. It was about... 8, 10, 12 feet from the road, sitting there, I think, uh, probably perpendicular to the road, and there for one purpose only, and that was to look for suspicious people on that bridge. Agent Gilliland apparently didn't see him. Uh, he didn't say anything. If, you know, he, he never, never radioed anybody. There is a car coming on the bridge with the lights out. You'd think that FBI agent looking for something suspicious on that bridge, car came by with the lights out, would said something. I mean, the, the story for the bridge didn't make any sense, really, at all. And they don't, I don't think they even had any um, real witnesses for it. It was literally the last day they were supposed to be doing the bridge surveillance, even in the first place. And where they found the body was impossible for him to have thrown him off the bridge anyway. That's another thing that just totally debunks that part of the story, besides the fact that it didn't make any sense how he would have been able to do it in the first place. It didn't make any sense um, when they, then they didn't stop him on a bridge, obviously. But then... Um, Another thing is that it wouldn't have made any, any sense because the way the river, design of the river, it would, his body wouldn't have been able to go to where they claimed that, that they found the body they, they claimed that he threw over from where he threw it, right? So that didn't make any sense. And then they had pattern cases, right, where they, they used like, like evidence, which the fire evidence was found to, uh, like, like later on, not in this case specifically, but in general, it was revealed that this that, that evidence is just faulty anyway, which I mean, any any common sense would tell you that. I mean, I right. So, in addition to that, one of the pattern cases, right. One of the, the cases they said, you know, fit into this and was all the other stuff. They already knew who committed that crime and it wasn't Wayne Williams. The significance of the Clifford Jones case has to do with it being the only known case out of the 29 murder cases that wound up on the authorities official list of cases. It's the only case in which eyewitnesses are describing for the authorities the molestation and the strangulation of Clifford Jones. There are also eyewitnesses describing for the authorities the disposal of the body by a uh, suspect who was not Wayne Williams. The state persuaded the judge to allow into evidence 10 additional cases, uh, eight of them children. 
uh, to show uh, supposedly Wayne Williams' uh, scheme or pattern or bent of mind of killing. So what that meant, in effect, was that Wayne Williams had to defend himself against uh, not two murders, but in effect against 12. Significantly, however, it's important to point out that the authorities did not include among their 10 pattern cases the death of Clifford Jones. They wanted to leave that out of the eyes and ears of the jury because had Clifford Jones's case been part of the 10 pattern cases, that would have empowered the defense to call witnesses who could get up on the stand and say, I saw Jamie Brooks molest and strangle Clifford Jones. Wayne Williams' name did not even appear in the investigative file in Clifford Jones's case. All of these cases are held together by essentially the same kind of fiber evidence. What we've got in the, in the Clifford Jones case, he happens to have at least one trilobal green fiber that is, is significant in his case that the authorities said was significant in the cases of Nathaniel Cater and Jimmy Ray Payne, which they introduced in the trial. So it becomes very clear why they left Clifford Jones's case out of the 10 pattern cases. They did want, not want the jury to hear one iota about Clifford Jones. Right, so there's so much problems with this case, specifically to, to hear and bring this up as an example of some, someone he was a, like, you know, had proximity to when he was a kid, but then somehow manages to miss all this evidence, but he's a scholar in his own, you know, hometown of sorts, right? He at least grew up there and he doesn't know anything about the case. Right? Was that close to one of the victims? Doesn't know anything about, about it? Thinks that Wayne Williams actually did it? Thinks that Wayne Williams actually had interest in killing uh, kids because what? I mean, j just to fit this, like, and it'd have been one thing if they just, okay, you kind of just throw it off to the side, but now you're, you're trying to use it to fit your narrative about, you know, white supremacy. When we know the Klan, <laughs> when we know now the Klan was involved, we know they was involved. They were involved. And when the, the you know, poor backs in the community said the Klan's involved, you don't want to do anything because the police didn't want to do it. Because, right, because they, they said they had a black of hair, black police department, that's, that's the, it wasn't who was running it. Right, but that's what, that's what they're trying to argue. But, Anybody who knows that the, 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 the white police officers wouldn't come shut that down. The FBI came in and shut that down. And a black ch chief going to go freaking go uh, solve a crime. Right? But the, the, the image that they're trying to put up that, oh, no, a black mayor and stuff is not going to solve it in and of itself. And politically, well, they, and, but, but they have this autonomy. They, they could do, you know, but that's not going to solve it because we need this. Uh, no. They didn't. They never had a, a black mayor with anything but symbolic. So, I mean, I found this very interesting, very interesting, right? And I'll try to uh, fit in a little bit of clips about the case um, when I edit the video so you can see some of the source of what I'm talking about, if I can find them, right? But yeah, that was very interesting. Okay, so I should be able to move on. Does let me ask a question. Does anti does anti racist discourse, which by the way often starts in academia, does that get created, gentlemen, outside the wheelhouse of the liberal foundation world? I think that's an example. But the kind of talking points that Hillary was using in that debate and subsequent ones. Yeah, I think I discussed the stuff about Hillary. Right. I think I discussed that. So I don't I don't think I have to repeat this part about Hillary and the um like obviously, you know, there's issues with Bernie. I mean, obviously there's issues with the campaign, right? Because he's mentioning like these issues with where Hillary, like or, or, or Kamala Harris or something like that, right? Well, like Kamala Harris in the uh, 2020 election didn't even get anywhere because like that stuff was shut down, right? It was shut down. Post Obama, that it, that wasn't going anywhere. Right. So that like that was already kind of politically off to the side, right? So they had to come up with this fantasy stuff, right? About, you know, Hillary, right? 
they, they rigged the election. I mean, I, I don't know how much I sound like I say it. They rigged the election. All they had to do was convince. I said this before. I'm gonna say it one more time. All they had to do was convince you that they convinced people, black people, to not support Hillary. I mean, not to not support Bernie and support Hillary or something like that, just so they could blame it on black people. That wouldn't even matter anyway. Black people don't have a, a large enough percentage of the population to really even affect the overall vote counts and stuff like that. They, he would have just lost the South, but he wouldn't have lost it so substantially that he couldn't have got it back when you go to the states where ain't nothing but white folks. Right? He could lose South Carolina and still win the primary. Right? I mean, that made it easier for Obama to win, right? Because he could win in South Carolina and then win everything else, right? If they try to rig it against Obama, for example. But that's, that. I mean, but, I mean, for for Bernie, he was as popular, but the only weakness he had that they knew is that he was probably a bigot, right? <laughs> Which they don't want to bring up. Bernie was probably, by all accounts, a bigot. He, I mean, there was nothing, there was no indication he gave a crap about black people. He didn't even, he didn't even care enough to pretend that he liked black people enough to get their votes, which is absolutely insane, right? At least Bill Clinton, who you know don't care about black people, cared enough to at least try to get some votes, right? You know what I mean? Like play the saxophone or something stupid, right? He did just, he did just the, like did dumb stuff to like pretend that he like cared about black people or to, 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 to try to relate. Besides just pretending that, you know, he, he was, you know, some kind of like Dr. King, you know, uh, protest, you know, like was, was doing all these protests and stuff and getting arrested, like, you know, protests. And stuff. Come on, bro. That was college stuff. We don't care about that. We care about the, the crime bill stuff. We care about, you know, you know, stuff relevant to today. Right. We don't care that that you probably went to a protest movement in college like everybody else. Right. But then afterwards went back to Vermont and did, you know, with all white people for the rest of your career. Right. It's like, it's insane. And then, you know, co-opting Martin Luther King's you know, legacy the way that he did, which was just disrespectful. Right. Like that pandering and stuff. That was, that was disrespectful when you could have just supported policies for black people, like you supported policies for every other single group, right? It was, it's just crazy. And they try to come up with these justifications, like, no, it really had to do with, you know, Hillary and their connection to these, these, um, you know, elite class black politics. Like what? <laughs> that tiny little percentage of the population is not going to give you, win you an election, bro. It's just basic demographic math. But it can give you the perception that black people don't, who aren't voting anyway are apparently voting for Hillary and such or uh, Biden in such great amounts that Bernie can't win. <laughs> it was rigged. They just rigged it. They don't care. They just get the this is whatever what they want the results to be is what the results was going to be. We're going to be. It's, it's not that complicated. It's only when you make, to make it that complicated, right? That you get confused about everything. A lot of those terms started in academia. Right. So what I'm saying is that get to the next is, so there's a, a way in which a number of these different disruptions of neoliberalization, the rollback of the old social welfare state, is summarized by a particular kind of anti-racist politics. Right. It's it's the way in which some people make sense of the world. Right. What they're seeing, they're seeing in neighborhoods, you, young people being rounded up by cops. They're seeing people being harassed under this new policing regime that's rolled out alongside the removal of the welfare state. I want to, want to reiterate that, that it's not, it's not helpful. We have to dig deeper to really understand what these problems are about or where their origins are, that they come from pu public policy, um, that they're not just a result of sort of never-ending uh, white racism, but rather the dismantling of the social welfare state was a, was a result of years of public policy work years of lobbying by different kinds of historical actors. And those actors were a combination of folks. They weren't just whites or even very powerful whites. They were also included black politicians, right? You know, we've talked about this. Yeah, I'll get to this in a minute. I'm gonna to go to the next part. That, uh, and this will be the last thing, at least from this. Because uh, other um, Tory gonna make a similar point about the um, is it around 11 something? Yeah, sure. So 
that's hugely important. And I don't think we, we pay enough attention to it. And I can actually connect this uh, to a, a degree to an elaboration on a point about institutional racism. There it is that someone had actually asked uh, in the question, I forget who, but in the 1930s and 40s, for example, the New Deal had a profound impact on the way that black people defined their political interests, right? I mean, blacks were impacted disproportionately by the Great Depression, even though the Great Depression technically has got nothing to do with race, um, where blacks were in labor markets and housing markets certainly meant, you know, and because of racism, right? But certainly meant that blacks were impacted disproportionately negatively by the Great Depression, right? It had much higher rates of unemployment. In the 1960s, though, um, you know, it's going to be a, another pro expression of progressive politics, but it's going to be a very different expression of progressive politics in, in some ways, and in, in some ways, economically, a more conservative expression of, of liberalism. And so the war on poverty doesn't look very much like the New Deal at all for a variety of reasons. And what happens is that, uh, and this is going to you know, shape, explore, I'm going to explore for a second, the way the political opportunity structures shape the way that black people define their interests. There's a debate over what, in the 19, early 1960s, over what anti-discrimination policies should be. So, so I can explain this. Okay. So, what I wanted to talk about there was... Okay, first of all, you saw the, the point that he was trying to make about the um, whether or not it was race or not. Like I said, that, that, that goes back to the Du Bois point of them, you know, so, sort of like already trying to make money off of the fact that they're racist and then trying to go back to say, oh, well, the, the only reason they were racist was to make money in the first place, right? So, I mean, come on. Like, come on. It's, it doesn't matter if you're doing something immoral doesn't benefit you, first of all. Let's just start from there, right? So if you do something immoral that is just obviously wrong, such as selling your house because a black person moved next door to you, and you don't want to live in the same neighborhood as a black person, if you lost a little bit of money, that doesn't matter compared to the fact that your home values are probably worth three, four, five times as much as what black people are today. Right. And that's wealth. Right. And that's in addition to the wealth of the schools you get to go to. That's addition to the wealth of how earlier you got into the university systems to get higher education to then pass on a higher living standard to your children and the opportunity for them to go to college, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, with already ideas about what careers that they want to have and stuff like that, right? Versus home values being devalued down to basically nothing, right, in the black communities. To where, I mean, I mean, this is like you could look up pretty much anywhere, just look up home values. Find some somewhere where you know black people live, look up the home values. Find the exact same type of homes somewhere where you know even lower middle class white people live and see the home values than middle class white be people see the home values. I mean, it's it's a night and day difference. We're talking about like double, triple the amount of money. Like on, on like a lower end sometimes. It could be that much. It, so th th that's a huge deal, right? And and we know, as, and the thing is, is, is a, is, race doesn't exist this is the point that i wrote down race doesn't exist and capital doesn't exist capital is a social relation right it's a social relation and act and, and if you look at actual existing capitalist society it's the political economic arm of white supremacy like i stated before right it's just that simple right any of these people who are quote unquote white at any point in time could have been like yeah, we ain't, we're not buying that stuff anymore. At any point in time. They could have been like, yeah, we're not buying that stuff anymore, right? Like, you don't get any value points for being harmed by yourself being immoral. 
just because someone else was benefit off you being immoral. Right? It's just absolutely crazy. It's like, when do they, like, again, you, you see this, this, this trend of a certain group of people not having to take responsibility for anything. But black people have to take, you know, responsibility for not being the only ones harmed by capitalism. When it's white supremacy doing most of the harm. And then I just have to get to the point about the New Deal versus the 1960s, which basically comes down to, to this, right? So if you if you know the old political, I think I don't know this came from Aristotle. I think I heard Chomsky say this came from Aristotle before. I, I think this might be in Aristotle's politics or something like that. But like, there's two ways of dealing with society, basically, as a ruling class. Like the welfare state, like basically pay people off so they don't revolt against you. Right? Just keep them happy so they don't revolt. Like just be nice to the people. Basically be, be nice to the people, right? Like if you're if you're the king, just be nice to your subjects. Or military force. So just kill them so they don't revolt. Just show that you're over dominant and powerful, right? That's the difference between the New Deal and the nineteen sixties. I'm not saying people weren't killed during the labor movement and stuff like that. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is when they when they went to go do government policy and black people were participating in these labor movements and this was the teens and and onward right already in the, the, the teens they had there were black people working you know with these labor movements and working with class politics this wasn't something that happened in, in the 1930s there, there's already a part of this throughout and growing right so during this time when black people were fighting alongside white people for labor rights, white people were granted uh, a welfare state in, it, in the form of the New Deal. Okay. Once black people started asking for civil rights and equality and political rights, these rights, like basic stuff like voting, right? This basic stuff like not being discriminated for jobs and all this, just like just normal life stuff stuff right they decided that oh now we want a police state i mean that's the that's the difference when 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 white people wanted it it was give granted when black people wanted it they went with the police state option white people was like oh we got ours is a police state and white people went home like bernie sanders did they just went home oh, that's over they got they got they got you know the bill passed we're going home doesn't matter what happens now. Like the same thing during the Civil War, right? We'll just let the counter-revolution take effect, go home. And then we'll just vote for the politicians that pass the crime bills and the war on drugs and put the drugs in the neighborhoods and kill all of the politicians and kill all the... And that's another thing that has to be addressed. Well, the first, first couple of things, right? So when the black people got civil rights, it's now we magically can't afford any more social programs anymore. It's magically now we can't, we can't keep down the price of college. Now, it's magically we, you know, we, we could just openly traffic drugs now as a government, right? We don't got to hide it anywhere. We just traffic drugs, get caught and be like, oh, sorry. It's just magically, you, you know, now that, you know, crime and uh, prison and mass incarceration is the only way to fix any type of social problems, right? It's just magically now we can't, like I said, we can't keep, keep down the cost of college. So when, when white people were, were building up all this wealth, with, with college, education, we could keep the prices low, but then all of a sudden black people get the opportunity. Now they could start going to college and I'll start this, the prices has to skyrocket, has to skyrocket, right? Just magically, right? Like magically at that point in time, we deindustrialized. This by coincidence, this is a coincidence that now we're starting this massive deindustrialization project and financialization of the economy, right? It's just magically that now that um you know we're giving out these subprime mortgage loans which is going to crash the entire economy by 2008 right and we're going to get rid of all these regulations that were set in place in the new deal now right right i mean come on bro i mean this was specific policy right and this is one thing you can't mention this era without mentioning too it's sort of like the atlanta thing right you mentioned atlanta child murder as well mentioned all the stuff that was actually going on right and there were black people involved in land child murders. I'm not gonna say there weren't black people involved, but it, it, mainly the black people involved had white handlers to a certain extent. And there were some elite black people involved too. 
who obviously got away with obviously by selling to poor black people and everybody else involved because they just pinned it on one guy. So they would, so the whole scheme didn't get in trouble, right? So the whole tra uh, sex trafficking and all the experimentation and stuff that was going on, they didn't, didn't get in trouble for that, right? So they covered it all up. But the same thing with 64. He meant, like, he's mentioning 64 and these civil rights bills and all this other stuff, right? Failed to mention the fact, I mean, at least, I mean, I don't know if he, he could have mentioned it somewhere right and, and go through the video, but while, while he was talking about it, the first thing that you could repeat over and over again, like I've been repeating it over and over again stuff throughout uh, me talking through this video, right? Is and is the Kennedy assassination and RFK being assassinated. So you had two presidential candidates, two coups within this time period. Coups. You don't think that had anything to do with what's going on? Like that's totally irrelevant. And like, and, and that, that, and the, the, the black people could get confused on there's crime and drugs in our neighborhood. We want you to just send all the black people to jail, right? That's the only way that could be interpreted, right? Like they obviously didn't want the effects of mass incarceration. Like this, like you, you can't be that dumb, dumb to assume that any black person was like, oh, you know, we want, we want mass incarceration. Yeah, that's what we want to solve these, these these drug and crime problems that we're upset about. We went mass. Come on, bro. No one else gets treated like that, right? You know, when white people are worried about, you know, fentanyl, you know, heroin, all this stuff, they're not, they're not talking about, you know, uh, going in with, you know, SWAT teams and, you know, knocking people's, you know, front, tire fronts out their houses with freaking battering rams and freaking tanks. And <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's completely different. When, when white people were selling the drugs before, Right, a couple of people went to jail. I'm not gonna pretend like nobody went to jail, but it wasn't like every single person went to jail. Some of them people got into legitimate businesses. If you watch, obviously, some of the videos. If you watch my channel, most of the videos about the hip hop stuff, then you probably watch similar videos that describe, you know, what happened with drug type of stuff versus what ha happened, you know, with when black people started entering that type of stuff. Right, every single one of the black pe people was either snitches or went to prison. And but but then you have on the other side, where you know the mob and the CIA is working together, and Jagger Hoover is walking around like he pretends that the mob doesn't even exist, and they're running all these blackmail schemes against everybody. Right? Come on, come on. I mean, it's just ob so obvious, like you know, what's going on. But that's pretty much going to be it. Um, this last video, I'm not really going to mess with it. I think I explained way too much. So I mean, I, I want to finish this one up. And then I'm going to go ahead and edit and get this one out. And then this is probably going to be so long anyway that I'll probably take a break and then I'll do the one, the next one on maybe Afro Pessimism because that should be easy. I got one video for, but one video plus another little clip from another video to show for that. And that's going to be pretty simple. So we'll do that one next.